Ja, da tror jeg vi starter. Hør dere meg bakerst der også. Velkommen til NUGs månedlige medlemsmøte. Veldig hyggelig at så mange kom hit i dag. Etter møtet så tar vi og tusler og får oss noe leske strupen med og kanskje en matbit. Veldig hyggelig hvis så mange som mulig blir med dit. Og i løpet av møtet så kommer vi til å sende rundt en liste så vi klarer å holde tellinger på hvor mange som har vært her og få e-postadress til de som vil ha annonseringer fra NUG fremover. Vi har ikke bestemt oss. Vi bruker å bestemme oss når vi ser hvor mange som blir med. Noen plasser er plass til fire, noen er plass til tjue. Når jeg ser hvor mange vi er her, hvis en brøkdel blir med, så mistenker vi drar opp til den pizzaplassen at vi blir slett. De burde være i stand til å ta en god høg med folk. Yes. Andre ting som er verdt å nevne. Ja, det blir en spørsmålsrunde forhåpentligvis på slutten, så vi kan holde ut til da hvis dere har mange spørsmål. Ellers er det mulig å stille spørsmål underveis, hvis han synes det er greit. Ja. So, when that is said, I wish to introduce today's speaker. I got to know him when he started using Mimes Brønn and asking about freedom of information requests to the Norwegian government. I've been involved with Mimes Brønn for a while and discovered that he had really interesting things to ask about and obviously was doing interesting stuff things uh, besides uh, asking for information from the government. So uh, I uh, asked if he wanted to come to Norway and uh, talk about these uh, topics. And uh, later on I discovered that he was talking with journalists and presenting uh, his findings. And uh, the news started to pop up in Anarcho Beta and often post not all over the place about uh, what he has been discovering. So uh, it was really fascinating to learn that a mathematician in uh, in Switzerland was it? Was uh, looking into uh, privacy uh, laws and uh, personal data, which is a topic that's close to my heart as well. So I managed to uh, lure him uh, here to Norway to uh, present to us what he has been uh, discovering over the last few years. He's uh, also uh, uh, working on an interesting website and starting his own company to help us all protect our privacy a bit better. So uh, I wish you all to uh, <clears throat> give a hand to uh, Paul Olivier uh, Dö. So thank you, thank you very much. Uh, I must say I'm very happy to be here because I had heard of, uh, of your group, of NUG, uh, a long time ago, the history, and um, it's always sounded like a cool place. So I'm really happy to visit here and to actually talk to you guys, um, to all of you. Uh, afterwards or during the talk. So feel free to ask questions at any point. So right, so the topic is psychometric profiling and impact on politics with maybe a slightly, provo <coughs> a slightly provocative picture, but you will see that it's partly justified. So the beginning of the story, and I'll try to tell it as I uncovered it, as I lived it essentially progressively. So the beginning of the story goes from Facebook likes to psychographics. So back in around 2012, there was a research project called My Personality that started to ask Facebook users to share their Facebook data with researchers uh, from Cambridge University and also to, file, uh, to, to fill psychological questionnaires. So all kinds of questions that psychologists have calibrated over the years to try to assess people at a psychological level. So, here is the first model of personality that psychologists use. It's not perfect, but it's really the first like, approximation of someone's psychology. Um, I'm not a psychologist, but that's my understanding of it. So you can criticize it all you want. There's lots of flaws, but that's really the first approximation. It's called the ocean um, model for personality that measures people along five dimensions that have been discovered, shown to be most reflective of our personalities. So the first five dimensions. So the first five dimensions of our personality, it's called ocean. So 
openness, consensusness, extraversion, agreeableness, and neuroticism. All right, so the history of this is already in itself fascinating, but I don't want to dig too much into it. But that was the psychologist's target, if you want. They had lots of Facebook data, they had this model, they had calibrated psychological questionnaires that were, had been filled by millions of people, and the goal was to try to see if they could predict from the Facebook data the psychological profiles, or at least this approximation of the psychological profiles. So that's what they started to do, and they published two big papers that were very widely circulated in the academic literature um, in uh, 2012 and 2014 um, based on those findings, and they were, they were not exactly the first, maybe, or on some aspects, but essentially it started a whole new field of psychometrics based on social media um, data. And here's the main graph, the one that's really striking to most people. Um, each line represents one of the different, one of the five dimensions. The, the thick one is the, the average of the five traits, those called big five. And this is the accuracy on the y-axis. On the x-axis is the number of Facebook likes that are required to reach that accuracy. All right? And there are some milestones along the way. So here is the accuracy that a work colleague would, would reach. If a work colleague was trying to evaluate your psychological traits, this is the accuracy they would reach, and their model can reach the same level with just less than 10 Facebook likes. If you're, uh, if you're comparing to uh, um, your family member, a family member would be around 120 Facebook likes. Right? So if you have 120 Facebook likes of someone, someone is very sharing on the web, then you can evaluate that person's psychology as well, that's, that's what this, shown, this shows, as well as um, the, the, that, that family member, and so on. And you can see that a spouse would be 270 Facebook likes, something like that. So that's, that's published peer-reviewed science um, in the Proceedings of the National Academy of Sciences in the US. And so this is, this is by Michal Kosinski, who, is, who happens to be in uh, Oslo right now, tomorrow, the day after giving several talks on his research. Now, I knew this because I was part of the My Personality data set. I had volunteered to share my data, to fill psychological questionnaires, to do all those things to help science, to help research. Now let's jump a few more years ahead and Cambridge Analytica. So here I'm ch slightly changing the chronology, but this is a picture taken from a talk given by a CEO of a company called Cambridge Analytica, a talk he gave in New York, where he explains what his company does for political campaigns. So you can't read it, but he explains that he takes data about demographics from all kinds of data brokers, um, data, data about lifestyles from more data brokers, he extracts from many different sources that are very easily available in the States. And from that, his company, Cambridge Analytica, predicts, well, the ocean scale and a few other psychological factors. And in this presentation, he explains that he uses that to give models to political campaigns, dashboards, essentially, for each state. So here, the state of Iowa, with different issues that people care about, their own psychological profiles, and the best way to target. So here is the psychological profile part where you see that the average is very, I mean, the average is, is the average. It's um, nowhere. But then he, he goes and digs deeper and shows that, well, for this one guy, I can actually have his profile from his social media data. Right? So the idea is that politicians now in the US have 220 million voters potentially, and they can drill down to each individual. They know their profile. They know how to target and so on and so on. Now, I said I changed a bit the, psycho the, the chronology because this was in September 2016. And by that time, I had been researching this company for a long time. Um, and the reason is that I had read an article in December 2015, um, an article in The Guardian about Ted Cruz using some firm that had harvested data from Facebook users. And well, it's quite explicit that it's called Cambridge Analytica, this company, and it's using research from Cambridge University. 
and it's trying to psychologically target people, et cetera, et cetera. So I was like, uh-huh, uh, you know, one plus one. I could remember this study I had done. I could see like the pattern. So I started just thinking, well, Cambridge University is a public university. I can do freedom of information requests there. And I started digging into how exactly did this research that I had done supposedly for an academic, you know, in an academic setting, how did that go all the way to a company and end up in a political campaign? So there were things that didn't add up. And the article explains a lot already. Um, it was further refined in a very recent article in The Intercept. Um, it explains already how they harvested a lot of data. And the idea was to go on Mechanical Turk. I don't know how many of you know what Mechanical Turk is. A few, just out of curiosity. So it's a platform where people can do work for very cheap and work that machines cannot do. So the idea is that you send jobs that are for a few cents and you send you know, hundreds per hour, a few jobs that each worth a few cents that humans can do in a second or maybe a bit longer, but very quick. And you help by doing that training machines, you know, artificial intelligence. So that job then becomes redundant if you want, right? So there is this platform that Amazon started using for their own products and then was opened up, this platform where you can do that. And so what one colleague of Kaczynski did, a colleague from Cambridge University, is that he started talking to those people in this company, Cambridge Analytica, and said, look, there is this research, there is this data, we can replicate, we can do all these things, and we'll do it through Mechanical Turk. So we'll give those people psychological questionnaires, which is a standard thing to do, actually, in psychology research. We'll serve these questionnaires to Turkers, as they are called. And at the end, I'll ask them to share their Facebook data with me for another extra dollar, actually. And for an extra dollar, they share their Facebook data, but not only theirs, but also all their friends. Okay. Right? So in that way, he multiplied for every dollar he paid, he got, you know, on average, 200, 300 people's Facebook likes. And that's how he amassed a huge data set. Right? So, as I said, I started, I mean, this was already in the Guardian article, but I wanted to really understand how, so I started doing freedom of information requests through my own platform um, to, to ask Cambridge, and Cambridge was Cambridge University, and Cambridge University was, they were really stonewalling me all over the place. So this is just four of the requests. I have 10 of them. They were just, I mean, I know all the exemptions that are possible in UK freedom of information law. Right? I even asked them for the, the processing of my own request, the processing of other people's requests, like try to investigate all around. It's clear that there was something. And then progressively, I looked and looked and looked, and the UK is pretty good in terms of openness for some types of data. You know, this is just classic journalistic work. I realized that there was more, and pretty quickly. There's a whole company behind called SCL Group. So SCL Group is a big multinational, it has worldwide presence, so in many countries all over the world. And it has many different components. SCL commercial, SCL election, analytics, digital, sovereign, defense. So all kinds of areas where they think that psychographic or psychology can help them gain an edge. It also has a think tank, Behavioral Dynamics Institute, a training entity, IOTA Global, and Cambridge Analytica, right? And if you go to the elections website, they're pretty, they're pretty chill about it. They say they've influenced elections all over the world. They've used their psychology, psychology tricks or whatever, however they present it, to influence elections in the Caribbean, in, in Ukraine, and in Africa, many of them, et cetera, et cetera. They're just pretty relaxed about it. And I was like, what is going on? You know, I mean, there's all those, this is now in the US election, et cetera. So that's actually, the one thing that started really interesting journalists, this connection with, I mean, some different, a wider group. So I want to tell you about the methodology. The methodology they are using and the methodology they are essentially using in many different contexts. And that's really important to understand. So I know you can't read this. This is the original slide from one of their presentations. And it's a pipeline going from some objective to some intervention at some point, and going through, okay, problem structuring, target audience analysis, campaign intervention strategy, and an intervention. And every, everywhere, there is a measure of effectiveness. All right, so essentially, it's, it's not that deep. They have a strategy, 
They develop it, they look at the audience, and I'll say a bit more about that. Then they decide on how they will intervene, and then they intervene. And at every stage, they have feedback mechanisms to measure how efficient they are. All right? The point of the slide is just to show that they've really conceptualized all of that, and they have, they have an actual real strategy and an actual methodology to do this. All right, so I said the target audience analysis. So what is that? Well, the goal here is to measure your audience, measure the audience you're trying to influence. All right, so this is from NATO sources, and we'll get to that in a second. And what they're trying to do is to find the ways that people self-identify. They're not trying to say from the outside, I'll define my categories this way. No, no, no. They're trying for each individual to find which communities those individuals associate with, which communities those individuals think they belong to. So for instance, an ethnic group would be something that people identify with. But one very interesting thing they say in a report actually at the House of Lords in the UK is that one community you can, that's really good would be Chinese netizens. So an online community of Chinese, Chinese citizens, but you choose where you go online, right? So there you start self-identifying with a different community online. So they say that this provides an edge in identifying people's interests, behaviors, etc. And then they have, a, again, a methodology of how they analyze every single dimension that they think is important um, for, for assessing the decision making of those communities, of those communities, not just individuals. So for instance, um, one, one aspect would be locus of control. So who does the community or individuals in the community, who, where do they think is the decision power, the, the changing, the, 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 the point where um, something can be changed, something can be controlled about the future. Right? So they, they really have a whole plan here. And then they decide on an intervention strategy. And SCL is pretty agnostic about which intervention strategy they will use. There are many different kinds. So they could do, you know, in a military setting, they'll do a cash handout and hope to affect the way a, a, a sub-community, a target audience will see some, some military that's intervening there, for instance, or a cash for gun program, that's an example, um, setting up a mandatory military service, a new training program, creating an event, some kind of smart propaganda. So propaganda that starts measuring how much people read, right? So that would be, I mean, that's the picture where you replace the leaflets with, with uh, Kindles because the Kindle will know who has read what. And so when you think about it this way, it starts to really look like Facebook, of course, right? Where every behavior on Facebook, every, every action, sorry, on Facebook starts to be measured. Another one that I didn't put on the slide because I only saw it recently is that there is a story where they actually intervened in um, the Caribbean and they, they were helping uh, um, a politician get reelected, I think, or f uh, trying to get elected. And so their idea was to start putting graffiti on walls themselves, right? Or paying someone to do it for them. So that then the politician could say that they had a special program to deal with the graffiti, <laughs> right? So that was part of their interventions, the pot potential interventions. Okay, and then there's, remember there's every time for every audience there is some measure of effectiveness because they want the feedback at every stage to know how effective they are. They are. And so another thing I found in some of this nature literature is something, is those dashboards. And when you look at the dashboards, it's kind of, you, you stop and you think a little bit. So what are those dashboards? Well, for each audience that they've identified as relevant, they look at one intervention that's possible. So let's see what happens if we give financial aid to a certain group, right? And then they have assessments for a whole bunch of different dimensions. So I'll read a few. Um, expectations of a bright future, anger at the prime minister, um, fear of corruption, uh, a common enemy, so imperialism, or this one was blacked out, but I found from, a, from another source, it's Qatar, um, because this is from Libya, actually. So this is from an intervention in Libya. Uh, social pursuits, uh, all kinds of things. And so then they measure their population by doing actually field research, and they decide, okay, if we were to, do a f if, to give financial aid, 
what would be the impact along all those different dimensions? How would we impact how that subpopulation thinks along all those different dimensions that we care about? This is in NATO papers, and this is actually um, what they do and what they are proud of doing. So again, um, the same thing. And they can, they can rank the intervention, you know, whether it goes in the right direction or not, essentially, whether it's red or green. Right? And each time they measure the effectiveness and you have to think, okay, that means a Marine goes on the field or actually a bunch of Marines go on the field, protect someone, an anthropologist or someone with that kind of background to ask questions and to see how effective their interventions are. So you can imagine that it will be slow, inefficient, not perfect, etc., etc. So I wrote a bit more about that. Um, the slides will be shared. I don't quite know how, but if you're interested, you can look at that link. Right, so this is the methodology they have. They really go with, with um, a general strategy, and then they, go, they, they sort of alternate between top-down and bottom-up. Right? They have the top-down strategy, but then they look at the audience from the perspective of the individual, and they try to see what, that individual, what are the levers to influence those individuals, or actually a whole community around the individual, and then they decide on an intervention strategy according to that. Okay, so where does Cambridge Analytica fit in this picture? Well, if you go back, actually it fits as a new intervention. But it's really the same overall methodology. So let me explain how. When you look at the history of the company, the history of people working there, their background, you know, going on LinkedIn, looking at dozens of different profiles, when people joined, what was their training, what kind of qualifications they have, etc. So around 2013, 2014, the whole company took a data turn. That's what I call a data turn. And started serving the Western world, essentially. So first the US, then the UK. And so in the Western world, your intervention, you don't have to send a Marine on the field. You can measure from many other sources how people behave, what can be the levers, et cetera. And so that's what this slide represents. In the US, there is a whole field of data brokers that exchange data about people, what people read, if people read Breitbart or watch MSNBC, where people shop, if they go to Safeway, what's their behavior on Facebook, et cetera, et cetera. And you can buy that data, right? And since a few days, you can buy even more of that data, as many of you probably know. It's not to say that this is not possible in Europe. Make sure you understand that. I mean, I would argue that you can do a lot of this already in Europe. And I have a lot of evidence to actually try to convince you of that. But regardless, from all this data, you can predict a lot of behaviors. And most people in the world and, uh, know about this. You can look at the voting history. You, well, you can buy that. But you can compute the turnout probability based on all this information. Or you can build model, models for that. You can build models of partisanship, ideology, and different issues that people care about. So that's what many, many vendors do in the US. And most people are completely familiar with this happening already. And actually, they don't have a choice, but they are comfortable with that. But now, this whole thing is adding more, right? So this is, um, this is adding the ocean scale, right? So the psychological traits that I described before, and a bunch of others that I found from other sources uh, of, about Cambridge Analytica. So the need for cognition, the need for effect, locus of control, reciprocity, scarcity, authority, fear, social proof. For instance, the last one is your need for social proof, so for social validation. Yes? <coughs> the arrows from Facebook, does it mean that they sell data or that they just screen fake? So that Facebook sells data? Yeah. Well, Facebook sells access to products that are based on data, right? So Facebook will do things that most people might not know like uh, they have a product called lookalike audience. So what I've described here, or maybe the next slide shows, so you have a prediction thanks to Cambridge Analytica. If you have an individual's profile, then Cambridge Analytica tells you, OK, this person, those are all the indicators. If you have 1,000 or maybe a bit more, 10,000, 100,000 of profiles that are very homogeneous, you can ask psycho psychologically or along other dimensions, you can ask Facebook, find me a million like this, right? 
So Facebook is not selling the data per se, but it's selling a service that's essentially exactly what you know, different campaigns would need. If they know they are very efficient, very effective with a certain subgroup, they'll try to scale it up. They'll try to bring it to another state, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? But Facebook's role in all this has been very, um, I mean, they've been far from transparent. So when reporting came out about Facebook's data being stolen or being harvested, et cetera, they've denied that things happened. And I know they happened because I have documents that show that they've happened. So this inter the Intercept report from a couple of days ago sort of puts more blame on Facebook, and I think rightfully so. So another turn that you can take in the West has to do with interventions. So the campaigns run on Facebook, email, access to, to different servers, to different, to the different uh, I mean, every page is measured with Facebook beacons and Google tags, et cetera. So every page you, someone looks on a candidate's website, the campaign knows. This person is interested in education because they looked at the education page, right? This person is interested in this because they've looked at this particular page in some of our um, associated campaigns. They also use SMS a lot, actually, to tr drive donations, et cetera. So they, they can measure, they can uh, collect data from many sources, identifiers from many sources, and then they can try to see what interventions they can drive and increase. So what, what, what behaviors they can trigger. So for instance, um, whether someone retweets something, reshares something, um, provokes a Facebook reaction, you know, those little uh, icons. Um, they can see if they can sell them hats or whatever um, other products, give a donation, etc. So you can measure a ton of things while the campaign is running, which is not true in you know, most other campaigns. But in the US, all the time, you get, you get triggered for those things. And so there is an interesting dynamic here. Because obviously, they want to, um, the campaigns want to increase donations, for instance, or reshares, so organic reach of some content they produce. And there is a constant feedback loop of um, what works and what doesn't, right? But now the input starts to be more psychologically targeted, thanks to those techniques that I described earlier. And so there starts to be a real interplay with Facebook itself. Why? Because Facebook is doing the profiling that I described just earlier, is trying to find the right audience for, or to increase the audience that has been generated originally to target some content. OK? And here, the content that's originally fed, the, the audience that's originally fed is more homogeneous at a psychographic level. So the theory, and that's just my theory, is that this provokes a more homogeneous reaction. OK? Because it's, it's targeting content. It's, some content will create fear, for instance, for a certain subgroup of the population. So if you only send that content to that particular subgroup, the response will be higher. And Facebook is designed to really measure those reactions and increase this and encourage that content to circulate. Why do I say that? Well, first of all, it's in every marketing, Facebook marketing um, instructions that you should try to create emotion. You should, that's the content that works on Facebook. But the second reason is that if you think back at, for those users of Facebook, Facebook knows phases where suddenly some type of content goes viral. Some particular type of content, like listicles, clickbait, and um, content encouraging you to have a certain reaction. And once someone figures out this little trick, this little way of provoking a reaction, then lots of people do it, and Facebook will start amplifying this. So much so that they have to tweak their algorithm. And here you're in a situation where close to a billion dollars was spent on online advertising, more than half of that by the Trump campaign, and some of it was targeted based on, psych on psychographic traits. So the, I see it as a stress test on Facebook, where you don't really know how much of that message Facebook actually amplifies. So to me, Facebook has a responsibility in just the transparency associated with its help that it provides to candidates. Right, so to summarize, another aspect of the interventions, of course, is that you have campaigns and you have lots of variations. You can experiment a lot with ads. That's the way Facebook is built. That's what it does. 
And the different campaigns, for those who know Facebook from the advertiser side, the, 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 the campaigns are excellent customers of Facebook. So they get additional access to what regular advertisers get. They get completely programmatic access. They don't have to deal with any of the interfaces. They just change their whole campaign strategy on a five minute basis. They send hundreds of thousands, or tens of thousands of variations of ads every day. All this is pretty much automated. And on top, in the case of um, the Trump campaign, there was a very thin pipeline of people, a very thin campaign, extremely reliant on automated tools. So you get high machine learning gain from every single um, successful targeting. So for those who know all the criticism that went around about this whole story, um, a lot of people denied a lot of things happened. Okay, so maybe I won't actually deal, I won't dig into that too much right now, but the way the campaign is structured, the way the tools they have, the, the way the tools they have are built, gives them a lot of plausible deniability of, about what they were doing. Right? So you can, you can talk to the digital campaign manager of Trump, and he can say, I didn't do psychographic targeting, and he will be talking earnestly. But the point is, he was sending this to an audience that had been screened by another entity that itself had screened based on psychographic traits. All right? So, and you know, when that person says, I didn't target psychographically, then everyone's happy to hear that and say, oh, okay, that didn't happen then. There is a lot of, a lot of um, very subtle issues around data transfer and where the actual intelligence in the targeting is, whether it's human or whether it's automated. And this has severe consequences in terms of responsibility, in terms of assessing whether there was a conspiracy. I don't think there was. It's just a bunch of people using tools to the most efficient and a lot of artificial intelligence injected into there. Yes. Uh, yeah, thank you. My name is Knut Irving. I'm just uh, enthusiastically happy for your talk. So, um, uh, because in, if I go politically on this and also ask what privacy law says and you, says, you say that one entity do one thing psychoanalysis of those data and another organization is handed over those data. In European and Norwegian data law, you can't run from that at all. You can't run from it. Uh, politically viewpoints or political viewpoints as, are illegal to, to map out. Mm -hmm. Even if they are in Facebook and you can store it legally. So it's a, it's a huge difference in what the United States allow you to do and how they get away for, for it, in Norway you will probably be shot down. Well, that's, the, that's the claim. Wait, wait. So, yeah. Yeah, the question is, why did you then earlier say uh, on the European part that we probably already do that? Okay, so actually, I, if I said that, I, what I actually mean is that data is available in Europe. The same kind of profiling happens. Of, of data collection happens, some of that profiling happens, and it could be that politicians do that. It, it, the, the data already exists. It's just a matter of a small team of data scientists getting together to do that type of profiling. According to him, the Conservative Party already do it. Right, of course. So there are, there, I have no doubt that there are lots of parties that already do this, actually. In France, just a couple of days ago, a bunch of parties, candidates, individual candidates got slammed for doing that. Now, what is relevant, and I don't want to get into this because it's going to be extremely complex, but I'll do it shortly. Um, the, yes, indeed, the law forbids this in Europe, for sure. And this is the huge opportunity of the story. Obviously, it's something that's deeply interesting to everyone. We all have an interest in, well, most people have an interest in living in a democracy. And that means in this context that I care that people around me, people's privacy around me is preserved, or at least that they have an understanding of what kind of targeting they get. There is suddenly a collective interest in data protection, which is very new. That's one aspect. But the second aspect is that this company is based in the UK. I maybe didn't say that, but it's very important. Because obviously, even though it's US citizens data, that company is based in the UK. And data protection is a human right. It's a fundamental right. So that means that the UK authorities, that other authorities where in Europe where there are Americans living that were subject to this profiling, 
all those authorities should be concerned for this and should investigate, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. My take is that this is deeply illegal, and because it happened in Europe, and so let's see what happens. But it's very hard to convince journalists of that fact and that this is important, and it, it takes several iterations of, of news reports. Thanks, society is probably five yeah. years behind on this. Sorry. Society is five years behind well, the development. Uh, well, let's see how f how much we can decrease this delay. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I mean, suddenly, uh, you, you know, I, I'm tra not just traveling here. Suddenly, lots of people are concerned about this and acting. Um, and one thing's for sure is in this whole debate, you know, lots of people said, well, this is, you're too worried about this. And uh, well, lots of people raised the alarm, and then lots of other people said, you're too worried about this. It's just a question of time before the possibility exists fully and is fully realized. Sorry. So, I'm sorry to interrupt. Uh, People here. I'm gonna, I think we missed it in the in the beginning. Uh, if streamer this here, so for those who see it on Uptake or for those who see it on streamen, so sends it around a microphone so that questions can come with on the video. So it's nice that you wait until the microphone comes to you when you're talking. Then a question from IRC on someone watching our stream, if you don't mind. Of course not. Hi, the IRC people. Yeah, hi. <laughs> is there a difference between fresh data versus old data? Is old profiling data of any value for users of the tools? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, so I'm not, I, I'm not an expert in that domain, right? So all I can say is that from some, um, from some documents I've seen, that that was a concern for SCL at some point in incorporating the technology of Kosinski, I mean, this, this, techno this uh, methodology, rather, of Kosinski. So they are very aware themselves of the significance of live data or recent data and old data, right? And so when you, for instance, when you test the, the, um, the, the online tools that are available that show you what's possible, um, those were built a long time ago for a specific subpopulation. So you have to take this, you know, those are the publicly visible tools. You have to be careful in inferring things from that. Thank you for the question. Questions. Um, so yeah, so just something that is part of the, the controversy that came around all those reports. Um, just before the election in October 2016, I think it's, it's important to highlight this. Um, there was this guy, Brad Prescali, who is one of the lead uh, campaign managers for Trump's digital campaign. So basically the guy sitting in front of Facebook deciding, I'll spend $200,000 in ads on this, in this way today. That's what this guy was doing, right? And it says pretty explicitly that he bombarded people with ads on Facebook based on Cambridge Analytica statistical models that isolated likely supporters. Right? So this was just before the campaign, and it was before the election, and it laid out pretty clearly what was happening. This is the first time this guy was in the limelight. In that report, he said a few other things that came to sort of haunt the campaign later. He was pretty candid with that journalist. But then the election happened, Trump won, and suddenly there was a lot of infighting in the campaign between different factions, between Cambridge Analytica and Brad Pascale to take credit for the campaign. So they started all demolishing each other's contribution. And it was in the interest of everyone to say, well, actually, well, of everyone else, of course, then Cambridge Analytica to say, they didn't do anything. And eventually, it actually was also in Cambridge Analytica's interest to say, we didn't do that, because they started to be under um, the eye of the law. They started getting real, um, real uh, heat for what they had potentially done. Now I want to show some more evidence that hasn't been um, shown in the news. Actually, it has been shown in the news, but no one saw it, including in Norway. So there was a report, a very old report, about Cambridge Analytica around the same time, I think October 22nd, just before the election, early November. There was an old report on, I think, Channel 4, and then Norwegian Television took it again. Uh, so it was Sky News, sorry. Sky News and Norwegian Television took it. You can see it on Cambridge Analytica's website. And in one of the different 
you know, B-rolls as they are called, one of the different little shots of the video, at some point you see an employee that's just turning pages from a scientific article. This is just like one and a half seconds, not more. And you know, if you're a guy with a laptop and does enhance a lot, <laughs> I mean, you can sort of make out some words and you can Google Scholar and so on, and you can find this paper. Um, it's actually the same, I'm sure of that. And this paper is called Method Effects and the Need for Cognition Scale, okay? So I have to explain a little bit. The need for cognition, I mentioned that earlier as some profiling that Cambridge Analytica does. The need for cognition is how does someone make a decision? How much does that person have to think about the decision? Or how much of that decision is actually emotional, right? How much do you rely on your in instincts or actually other parts of your brains that are more cognitive? So that's, that's what the need for cognition scale is. And what this paper is about, it's essentially what if you have a ton of psychological profiles or questionnaires that you want to analyze? You know, you have calibrated questions that give you the classic need for cognition scale, but actually you have so much that you can hope to detect more features in that data. So what can you detect? Maybe it's not just a linear scale, but maybe it's a two-dimensional scale. That paper is exactly about that. So it's basically perfect to argue, well, they're doing psychological profiling, at least on that scale, right? This was October 2016. You don't know that they are doing it for the Trump campaign, but certainly someone in the headquarters sitting next to someone who has a Trump sticker on their desk is looking at that. And, um, right, and so that's one part of the evidence that they, are, they were actually doing um, psychographic targeting. And if you want to extrapolate a little bit, I mean, who are they detecting with this? Are they detecting the people who will think deeply about the issues <laughs> and vote based on thinking hard about what the best decision is? Is that who they're going to target? Well, I don't know who they targeted, but you can make your own opinion, right? Okay, so something else that we were doing at the same time is finding people, finding people who might be really willing to get access to their data, all right? So, this company is based in the UK. It's the same all over Europe. You have a right to access your personal data. You can just write to a company and say, I want to see my personal data. And so I convinced a bunch of people, this was in December, to start asking. And there were all kinds of problems with the fact that they had to ask because how does the company actually identify people? Is it based on their name, their address, whatever? People have multiple names on the voter records. It's not the same as their actual name. It's actually very hard to pay someone 10 pounds if that someone doesn't want you to pay 10 pounds because they don't give you an account that works internationally, for instance. Um, there's all kinds of problems because you have to pay to get access to your data in the UK. All kinds of, of problems, it, huge delays, but eventually they started responding. And this is really good because the more they respond, the more they potentially incriminate themselves, right? That's why they didn't want to respond in the first place. So they, they talk about the different clients that they have, the different service providers, but that response in itself is not compliant. That's because they're not, it's not detailed enough. So you can start asking, wait a minute, you're telling me you're buying data from digital marketing platforms? Okay, which? And you're sending this to clients? Where? You know, you can see who? You can start asking all kinds of questions. And this is going to be ongoing, and a pro bono lawyer stepped up to help those people, pro bono lawyer in the UK. And so this is another part of the story that we'll pursue. But part of the response is also that you get a list, a list of different dimensions that they're willing to acknowledge they're ranking people on, and those are political issues. So you're right, this is in itself illegal in the UK. So let's see what happens again. Another thing that the company did is deny that they were using Facebook likes. And then, well, turns out there are videos online where they explain how they use Facebook likes to do this targeting. So, I mean, this is a, this is a snapshot from the video. Actually, no, it's a snapshot from the video I had saved, re-uploaded with the logo of my company, right? Uh, after I gave it to the Guardian, and um, once the Guardian called them and asked, okay, how do you explain this video? They took the video down. So, <laughs> It's, they're not exactly forthcoming. 
I think I've said that already. Um, just some impact that this had. So you know about this one, right? Uh, lots of people have read this, I suppose, have heard of it. It comes from an article in German uh, that was written in Switzerland uh, that I helped research and then that was translated in English. It was fascinating to see the evolution of the idea, the counter idea, the whole dynamic. You know, you produce a very lengthy report with tons of information and then someone writes a blog post the next day saying, yeah, I don't think so. And then everyone cites that. It's just the dynamic is incredible. Then there, was, there were more reports um, in the UK uh, with Carol Cadvaller on uh, the, the whole company behind the role of Robert Mercer as a financier for all this, his, uh, his, his outlook, et cetera. And that, because they were also involved in Brexit. So Cambridge Analytica was also involved in Brexit. So this is very relevant to, uh, to the UK as well, to the extent that there's now two investigations going on, one on the financing and one on the data flows. Um, so one with the Data Protection Office and one with the Electoral Commission on this whole thing, because it looks like basically all the tricks that politicians have to finance their campaigns, they're developing parallel tricks to, um, to transfer data among them, right? So in the, the Brexit referendum, for instance, you had to declare um, legal entities to campaign on one side or the other, and these joint entities had funding caps and they couldn't collaborate. They couldn't collaborate, but they could share data, apparently, if they go through Canada, there's like a whole thing uh, around this. Okay, now I have not very much more time, but I want to talk about the most concerning aspect. The most concerning aspect is information warfare. So there is this very famous quote that um, war is the extension of politics by other means. And just a few days ago, I was walking in Berlin alongside the Berlin Wall and I saw this quote on the wall painted, you know, in this place where you have lots of paintings. And it says the opposite. It says that politics is continuation of war with other means. And that must have, been seem, must have seemed very apt in 1990 or so, when suddenly, you know, the Cold War is ending and people thought, okay, now it's just politics. Well, it turns out that that's not true. Uh, St Steve Bannon has said that politics is war. And more and more we see a complete confusion between the two. And I guess that's what's brought me here, is that part of my research showed that um, SCL is also helping militaries in Europe deal with their own population. And deal, I put in quotes because I don't know how, what, how to qualify it more. Um, SCL is training NATO troops on how to counter ISIS propaganda, how to counter what they call Russian disinformation. And that's, it has trained a Norwegian um, army, uh, uh, army employee or a mili military person who has said on Twitter that she attended a course with them. And so, and you can find also on Twitter a copy of the manuals. So that's why I got interested in no Norwegian freedom of information laws because I was very curious at getting a copy of this manual. You know, what, what did they, how did they train people? What was the content of this course? and actually of the, of the table of contents. And so this is really important to understand, is that they're really, they have a military arm and they have an election arm. And the two are working, but on different sides. In one side, the military arm, they're trying to counter ISIS propaganda that's trying to recruit people to go to Syria. And on the, the election arm, they're trying to convince people, they're trying to recruit them to their political campaigns, essentially. Right? So it's the same techniques, but on different sides. And they're using the experience built in one side with the other. And they explicitly say that. And I find that concerning. Now, I'll quickly finish. Reasons for optimism. Well, first is a lot of my actions are also tied to Facebook and try to force them to disclose more information about their own behaviors or what they offer and so on, and to disclose it to each individual. So I can talk to you about, uh, about this more later. But if you go on Facebook, partly through my actions, you can have access to more of how you're being targeted. And the second thing that I mentioned earlier is that um, 
lots of people are now asking Cambridge Analytica for their data. Cory Doctorow tried to emphasize this, tried to promote this idea. And so you can, um, you can hope that more transparency will lead to different, uh, to, to new consequences. And one more thing I want to say is that, because it's very relevant to this audience, it might be a bit of a jump from what I was talking about earlier, is that there are new laws coming around personal data in Europe. So it's called the GDPR, General Data Protection Regulation. Out of curiosity, how many people have heard of this? Well, OK. Very good. OK, I'm glad. Because this is significant. This is really significant to most companies, to most IT companies, to most tech companies, to pretty much most companies. So if your company hasn't heard of that, please try to flag them. The, the idea is that partly better enforcement, better protections, et cetera. But one of the rights that's going to be very interesting is the right to portability, the right to take your data and move it to another service. And this is partly aimed at giving citizens more control over their data and also more encourage them to think about the commercial value of this or the value of the data in itself to try to extract more out of their personal data to be more careful with it. And I think that's a good, actually, a good reason for optimism going forward. And I'll finish, so thank you. Hello. Yes, uh, so um, uh, when you agreed to participate in this uh, Cambridge University um, uh, research project, uh, I assume they promised that your personal data would be kept confidential. Uh, did you discover that they had actually shared your personal data with um, uh, the private companies that had funded the, the research? So the, the private company didn't fund the research. The timeline is different. So it was purely academic research, right? And um, they, the scientific papers were produced out of this, etc. And then the idea certainly flowed from the, the academic setting to a company. I'm fine with that. That's obviously how some of the things are supposed to work, right? Um, at some point, there was discussion of a service built on the original data being shared with the company. Now, that's more problematic. And actually, if you go on the website of those academics, you can see that they're trying to, they're trying to raise some money by offering a service to companies. Right? It's called Apply Magic Sauce. So that's not something I expected when I joined this research project. But it raises serious questions about who can control a machine learning model based on personal data, right? And especially, depending on how the model is constructed, the model can be considered to be a sum, really, of personal data. It right? can be identifiable in this. But the further concern is that the data was accessible to hundreds of academics because they were building. I mean, I used to be an academic myself, or I still am. So it's, it's, I'm fine with that. There is a trusted circle of people who have to fill a, a, a form to sign that they will only use the data for a certain purpose. There's definitely a few individuals who didn't respect this. Definitely. Now, on top of that, did they copy the data and is the data still in Cambridge Analytica's models? They claimed that data was deleted. SCL claimed that data was deleted. How do you verify it? Right? You don't know. I have some ideas how to do it, but it's going to take a while. Uh, I'll grab the mic while I'm here. Um, so clearly, if it's, if it's illegal to do so, then it, it shouldn't happen, then society has decided that that's bad. Um, to the best of my knowledge, in the U.S., there, isn't, there aren't laws against profiling voters and, and that sort of thing. Um, I don't know exactly the wording of the law, whether if it happens in the U.K., but it's on U.S. voter Citizen. profiles, if that's still legal or not. Let's assume for, for the moment that that's not the issue. What is fundamentally wrong, in your view, about profiling the voters and presenting to them the, the things that they're most relevant in, the arguments that are most relevant to them. I mean, that's, that's the foundation for most advertisement and most communications that you get from companies and, and campaigns and everything anyways, right? Can I, can I give you one talk? Sure. 
the blunt answer to this one is well, that, that I, I that's, have, the, that's have, the idealized answer. I have to accept answer. because I'm staying at his place tonight. <laughs> that, that's the idealized answer, and it's their marketing of, of this service. Is it says, we will, we will give you the thing that's relevant to you. The other way of reading this one is, I'm going to tell you the lie you'll fall for, and him the lie he'll fall for, and... Under the situation we used to have, where it was all broadcast, you would hear the lie I was telling him, and he would hear the lie I was telling right. you. And you can see through the lie I'm telling him, and you'll point it out to him. And he can see through the lie I'm telling you, and he'll point it out to you. But this way, neither of you knows what lie I'm telling the other. So, so neither of you it, can called, save the other from It's called the hypermised public sphere. A public discussion on political issues. That's the point of an election. You get together, you decide what's relevant, even to a minority, and you vote according to that. I mean... If, if you personalize, you start fragmenting people, you make them a lot more influenceable. I'm not saying people do, but it's already a problem because it's, it's an issue of power. I agree. I just wanted to have a verbal answer. Yeah. <laughs> Be very explicit. Yes. Yeah. Uh, 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 how can... Uh, do you have a tip for how we can uh, get the Norwegian people and the Norwegian media and the Norwegian politicians to be... Uh, interested in uh, privacy and these issues you discuss here today? I have a very good way of getting a lot of media people really, really interested in data protection issue. Problem is, it's going to create a ton of problems. Here's how you do it. You go to every one of the top 10 newspapers in Norway's websites, right? You go to their website, you look at what tracker they have on the website. You, you go without an ad block, without anything. It's going to be a few dozen, if it's like any other country in the world. And you look at the, co the cookie values associated to that. And you ask them, the website, for the data associated to those cookies. Because in law, they're responsible for it. They are the first party. They are the so-called data controller. They're responsible for the processors they contract with for all their tracking that the processors are doing. All right? So you ask the newspapers, lawyers, for your personal data. It's going to create a hell of trouble, but that's the only way to get to the bottom of this whole data collection that's happening, this whole ecosystem behind. So I can detail the whole plan if you want, but um, I think <laughs> he has a follow-up question, I think. You have to... Uh, yes, uh, the Norwegian state used those trackers on uh, the you state websites. You can do it too. You can Even do it. Unions, yeah. You can do it. You can. I mean, it's, I don't know what happens after in Norway because you're not in the European Union. But, I mean, it's, it's even better if you're in France and you go do it on a German website. Because you can. And then you go to your French authority and you complain about this German website. And it escalates directly to the European level where the law is pretty clear. Um, I'll just add some clarification. I was at a uh, different event a week or two ago, um, and this was an ad tech company. Mm -hmm. I won't name which one it was. Um, and they mentioned uh, they are, I think they were based primarily in the US, but they have uh, international uh, operation. Um, and they mentioned that they collect approximately 3,000 events per American per, I can't remember if it was per hour, but I think it was per day. Okay. Um, and so when you consider that scale of information collection by a single company, yeah. not the largest by any means within that domain, um, then it's, it's quite clear there's a significant information uh, yeah. volume it's, out there. Uh, there's no doubt, and there's no doubt that lots of European companies are collecting, or US companies are collecting the same amount on Europeans. European companies are collecting a lot too. Um, it's all, the Google lawyer in Switzerland calls this compliance risk. That's the technical term, right? So how much can I afford not to comply with the law? That's the, there was a question in the back. Thanks. Um, uh, trying to speak up a little bit. Uh, just thinking about what is wrong with what, you, with what you're describing now. And to me, it seems like it's lack of transparency and lack of consent. But could you imagine some of these techniques being used for good, like to increase politicians' accountability and to have 
mini referendums of sort, so you can get more accountable politicians. Sure. Sure, like many company, like many technologies, it can be used for good and bad, no doubt. But you're right. One of the big problems, or the big problems, are transparency, accountability, all those uh, consent. You're perfectly right. Um, but because there is not, that is not present, a whole bunch of business models exist that create a ton of problems. <laughs> I mean, any. I was saying earlier, if you start asking your newspaper for information about the tags, etc., I mean, essentially, you're making journalists question their own, their own salaries, where the salaries come from, right? But if they think for a second, they won't be very happy. If they think for two seconds, they'll actually see, well, wait a minute. This, this is not an ecosystem that's beneficial to us. I think it's 85% of the of the money that flows into advertising online goes into Facebook and Google's pockets, right? So it's, it's a huge amount. And the journalists see a trickle of that, what happens after you know, a ton of other companies suck up the money. Some of the audience here have spoken to media, to politicians, to friends, to others about uh, privacy issues. And uh, they get the feedback that uh, other people don't have the big interest. Yeah. And uh, what's, what's your uh, view of that? Is, is the biggest problem here that, uh, the people, the, that this, this is not discussed by the people, that the people is not interested, it's not, it's not, it's not a debate around this? Well, it's not that they're not interested, it's that even if they are interested, even many people who are interested, like here, they don't know what to do. Even if you are, you're, you're powerless, right? So the, the key thing is to find incremental steps that make people feel powerful in this whole thing. Like they feel like they are changing things progressively. So if I can plug, if you go to personaldata.io, you can sign up for a mailing list where that's my company, right? Where we're going to try to offer services very soon that will help you get access to your data. That's a first active step that you can do, and that's in the law, you, in the law in many countries. You can get a copy. Why is this good? Most people tell me that's, that's useless. What do I do with this data? Well, if you care about privacy, you can take this data and you can show it to others. All right? So it's too bad my talk was about this. Otherwise, I would have shown you a bunch of information I got in this way about my own personal data. Right? from tons of companies. And I could show you, actually, this is what's being done in Europe. And you can see it. And if you were to do the same, you could show it to your neighbor. You could show it to people around you. If you were an educator, you could use it to show it to your students, actually, this is the tracking that happens when you are online. So I think that's an active step that can you know, bring changes progressively. Um, you mentioned Facebook uh, quite a few times, but you didn't say much about Google. And as we all know, it's the world's largest advertising company, and they have trackers on about 85% of all the major websites on the world. So we now have the issue that some employers are uh, forcing the employees to sign up to uh, Google accounts and accept Google's terms of service in or because they have bought Google uh, apps for work. Uh, what, how do you think about the legality of forcing your employees to sell their personal data to the, an advertising company? That's difficult, but it's, it's a very difficult question to answer. My, um, so I want to change the question to what can you do once you have accepted because you need to earn a salary? And so what you can do is ask for a copy. It's the, I insist again, this is the only active thing you can do in the law, and it creates a ton of problems, a ton. I mean, they would, you related the story, right? I mean, with, uh, it was a slightly different thing you can do also is you can ask to see the contract that binds Google and your company. Oh, um, that's interesting because I actually did that. And I, I am okay. the only one in the company who has refused to accept uh, their terms of service. Uh, so what actually happened was that um, first I was given a password and asked to uh, go to the Google page where it says you have to accept the terms of service. And so I clicked, OK, let me read the terms of service. And after about 40 pages, I said, if you have Google Apps work, then this might not be the actual <laughs> terms of service. 
And so I asked our lawyer, who contacted the salesman at Google, who after three months actually sent me a link, which says, oh, oh by the way, this is the actual terms of service, yes. which include everything in the first terms of service plus something else. Yeah. So I said to them that this is actually uh, quite um, uh, a breach of the Norwegian data, uh, Personal Data Protection Act. For sure. And, and then they actually sent me a link to a third page, which <laughs> is um, common for uh, the whole EU, yep. where it says what kind of data they protect for the things that they actually pay for. Yep. But you still have to accept the terms of service for the free things, which include uh, tracking, in order to use the paid for things. Yep. I have no, no question that that's true. And it's highly illegal, I agree. You are agree that it's illegal, yeah, that's yeah, very yeah, nice yeah. to say. Yeah. Well, I mean, I'm not a, law a lawyer, but in my reading, the, problem, the main problem there is enforcement. Yeah. I mean, those companies are basically, for Google, they're saying they're a processor, it's not their responsibility, it's going to be your company's responsibility, and it becomes very hard for you to tell your company, look, you're not respecting data protection law because you're delegating to a, an entity that's not respecting because of all those reasons. It's just murking about. Can you speak up? Can you speak up, please? No, it's not amplified. Okay, um, I, uh, what can I do as a UX designer to help you make a tool that lets other people um, sue these companies, basically, or at least get their data to cause them trouble and uh, a lot of costs? So what can you do as a UX designer? Yeah, I, I would to like to help you, basically. Oh, I'm okay. applying. <laughs> I'm <laughs> well, I, I, if you go to my website, uh, it can take some help, for sure. <laughs> So if that's the question, yes, I'll... <laughs> Thank you. Yeah. All right. Happy to take more if anyone... Would it make sense to go to a pub? Yes. So is it, is it on or...? Thank you. Okay. Uh, I think uh, the major question is how we can handle this regarding making it enforced. We already have public, in, in, in Norway and other European countries, we have what's kind of labeled as uh, uh, state-run supervision or oversight of, of, of their living after or by the Data Protection and Privacy Acts, okay? Yeah. So basically, you send the, the people paid by the taxpayers to go after the other ones paid by the taxpayers. That's one opportunity. The second opportunity, I guess, is talking with the political parties on how they're doing that. And one, one of those who have done that in another capacity, I've been there myself, been asked by the biggest party in Norway to explain to them why kind of what we should do when this data protection, or what they call it, the surveillance, the data personal. Norwegian data, data directive. What's its label in, a, in English? English, please. Da, yeah. Data retention. Data retention, sorry. Uh, is that, um, you know, they, they did this kind of, after explaining all this with the top notch experts, they did that shoulder you know, lifting, and I said, well, here we're giving away our all privacy, and nobody cares, not even the politicians, even if it's breaching the constitution. So we are there. So it's a very hard and hard and tough job to achieve this. So do you, and here it comes. And this is important, because here is the power in society. It's not on your friends or this guy over there with user interface. Sorry to say that. How would you recommend that we could influence the other politicians in Europe doing the same as we tried to do in Norway? So, I'm not quite sure I fully understand the question, but the, um, the worry right now that you hear in a lot of US circles is Russian influence, right? So, I don't know that Russia influenced the US election. Of course they influence. 
let's, let's ignore the question. Because of all this, they have the potential of influencing. And that should be enough of our worry, right? I mean, the politicians, they might have all the defaults in the world, all the problems in the world. Do they really want to compete in an election where the other candidate is paid for by Russia? Well, some might want to, but most, <laughs> most will not want to, right? At least they want a fair battle. And that doesn't sound like a fair battle. But this whole ecosystem clearly makes this possible by circulating, by abusing tricks that this ecosystem allows, fake news, foreign influence, just money flowing in to buy ads, all those things. Circumventing electoral rules like in the UK. I mean, this is a concern to a lot of politicians actually already. So that's why this story is actually a good one to, to insist on. And one question we've been discussing several of this audience before is uh, education. Mm -hmm. uh, in Norway now, the more and more students as in state schools, they are uh, getting a free uh, device. They're getting either an iPad from Apple yeah. or they get uh, a Google device. Yeah. Uh, Google apps for education. Yeah, they use uh, Chrome. Chromebooks, mm -hmm. and uh, this is the richest areas in Norway with uh, the most resources that uh, choose to uh, with the highest educated uh, population, with the highest educated uh, yeah. uh, parents. So the question is, how do we uh, uh, deal with that? It's like. How do I, as a parent, uh, discuss with the government and discuss with the population and the school uh, these issues? Because there is also possibilities to sue the teacher and sue the school mm -hmm. and all this, but <laughs> the kids are in the school. And they yeah. will have to be there for a long time with the same yeah. teachers and the yeah. same everything. Yeah. So it's like... So, so the story is kind of the same as Google for work, right? It's actually concerning the next generation. So you can make a stronger point that you don't know what can be done in 10, 20 years with this data, right? This data that's being collected now. I mean, if you compare, the impact might be bigger on those kids. Also, more people have responsibility, ethical, legal, the guardians, etc. So it's you can make a stronger case, I think, around education than around Google for work. But again, ask for transparency, ask for the data. Again, it sounds very simple, but already they obfuscate so much, so much of this, and it's really hard to argue that everything's legit if this right of access. I don't know the exact number in Norwegian law, but it's written there. You have a right to a copy. You can show it around you. I have that right. Why is that right not enforced? Why is that right not, not you know? This is the basic democracy. For those of you who know me, Ms. Brun, it's the same principle with freedom of information. The government's taking decisions about you or that affect you. Well, you have a right to see the documents. It's the same thing. It's a tool to balance power. And here, the authorities sort of in agreement with big companies decide on things that affect not you, but your children, well, there's a transparency mechanism. Use it. It's, it will, more will come out of that. So just, I know you have to finish, but just to sh show this, this is my own data from one provider. And it's sensitive because it's all my identifiers in a ton of companies, 50 of them. So when you think you're anonymous on the web, most of you know that it's not true. But this is really my passport in all those different companies, these online advertising companies. Thank you for taking a high-res picture. <laughs> right, so but when you show that to someone, it's, it's, uh, it's, it, it's very informative. And of course, you can use it to track down from one identifier to more, to more, to more data. And it's a very good transparency mechanism. OK, I'm done. <laughs> Thank you. 
If you want to get involved in these kinds of questions, please get in touch with Nug. We are interested in this topic. <laughs> <laughs> to say the least. 